Tonight, Israel at war. You just had the air raid siren. There you go. You can hear the sound of an explosion overhead. I can see some smoke. More than a thousand now killed, thousands more injured as hostilities between Israel and Hamas only intensify. Our correspondents are on the ground on both sides of the war. Plus, stories of grief and horror as more than a hundred were taken hostage by Hamas. We'll speak with family members desperately pleading for their loved ones as Hamas warns it will start to kill hostages if their demands are not met. And peace deals have been brokered, photo ops taken, but why haven't any succeeded? How we got here and how things could possibly move forward following such terror in this special edition of ABC News Live Prime. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with the horror of war and the harrowing stories after Hamas fighters stormed into Israel, killing indiscriminately, kidnapping children, women, and the elderly. It's being called Israel's Pearl Harbor, or it's 9-11. It is the worst attack on that country's soil in 50 years. Tonight, Hamas has at least 100 people hostage, and they are vowing to kill them one by one. The death toll on both sides already staggering. At least 900 Israelis, including 100 bodies found today in a small farming town. Thousands more are injured, and we know more than 260 people were killed at a music festival in the desert. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the country is preparing for a long war. Israel has called up 300,000 military reserves and has cut off all food, water, and electricity in the Gaza Strip and started airstrikes. Nearly 700 people there have died. At least 91 of them are children. But what happens to those hostages if Israel continues to bombard Gaza? And there's concern tonight Americans may be among those who are being held. We'll hear from an anguished mother in just a few minutes who tells us her two sons got taken hostage while she was on the phone with them. Tonight, we'll look at how it came to this and what an extended conflict might mean for Israel and the world. Our team is standing by from Israel and back here in the U.S. to break it all down. We begin with World News Tonight anchor David Muir reporting from Tel Aviv. We're having some technical difficulties there. In Gaza, growing grief and devastation. Israel has controlled the territory's borders for years. So how was Hamas able to organize and launch such a sophisticated attack without Israel being aware of it? ABC's chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel reports from the border. Tonight, Israel on a war footing. 100,000 reservists amassing in the south, moving towards Gaza. This conflict looks set to enter a new phase. A ground invasion could be imminent. We're starting to see large-scale movements of the Israeli military throughout this area in the south now. These are armored personnel carriers, essentially heading up towards the front line. We're seeing a lot of men, a lot of munitions, and a lot of movement. This is starting to look really like a country at war. And now Gaza, one of the world's most densely populated areas, is under relentless bombardment. But many civilians are being caught in the crossfire. Over 680 people killed in three days, 140 of them children, according to Gaza's health ministry. For parents on both sides of the border, the grief overwhelming. And whole neighborhoods are being wiped out. A frantic scene as rescue workers dig for miracles. Is there anyone alive? This man shouts. And from this pile of debris, six month old Sama Al Wadia pulled out, still alive. The problem has started before this crisis. We have had shortage of medications, medical supplies prior to this crisis. <laughs> And already struggling hospitals are now overwhelmed, with Israel now cutting off water, electricity and food to Gaza. One doctor with this warning. The health system will collapse. What will you do without water, electricity, medication? Of course, there will be a collapse. The problem is that every, every five minutes you have a new breaking news talking about more and more injured Palestinians, among civilians, of course. There will be no room for those people to be treated in hospitals. That's why I think the best thing to do if this war should stop at once and at the same time they should open the borders for us to send patients outside, maybe to Egypt, maybe to Jordan, maybe to the West Bank, I don't know. 
but they should, the border should be open. And even today, Hamas still hitting Israeli cities and civilian areas. We witnessed it firsthand. Just hearing a sound of, we just had the air raid siren. There you go, you can hear the sound of an explosion overhead. I can see some smoke up there. Sounds like the noise of an intercept, uh, perhaps from the Israeli Iron Dome defense system. And that's what people here have to live with all the time at the now. It turns out Hamas had been planning its shock attack on Israel in secret for months. Now releasing this video showing fighters training on motorized paragliders practicing their descent into Israel. How this all began 48 hours ago. But the hell Hamas unleashed for so many may only just have begun. Now spilling back into Gaza. The cries of those people so difficult to hear. Ian Panel joins us now from Tel Aviv. Ian, you saw those Israeli tanks moving toward the Gaza border. Uh, describe the scene and, and what it could mean for the days ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think what we're seeing, it, it's not just the men and munitions, but you also see logistics, like every gas station, there are large collections of soldiers. You see coach loads, bus loads of them moving into the area. It's starting to look like a staging area for a major military operation. And I think there's pressure on Netanyahu that the airstrikes, as punitive as they are for the people of Gaza, as much suffering is going on on that side of the border, that it's only the start of a much larger operation. But where does it end? Does Israel want to just have an incursion into parts of Gaza to try and eradicate Hamas, something it's tried before, unsuccessfully so. Does it want to invade Gaza? But then it owns the problem. It owns a swath of land which would be very hard to govern and you're still going to have to deal with a problem from militants. And I think the last big unanswered question is what does Hezbollah in the north across the border into Lebanon do? Does it respond? Does it join the fray? In which case Israel potentially has to fight a war on two fronts. Lindsay? All right. Ian Panel for us in Tel Aviv. Thanks so much, Ian. And let's get back to World News Tonight. Anchor David Muir reporting from Tel Aviv. Israel at war. Hundreds of Israeli rockets pounding Gaza for hours. Retaliation. For the brutal Hamas attack on Israel, thick black plumes of smoke billowing into the sky. These men capturing the destruction unfold from inside a neighboring building as the sun sets, explosions lighting up the night sky. targets in just three hours. Dozens of Israeli fighter jets. Tonight, the Israeli Defense Ministry declaring a total siege of the Gaza Strip. No power, no water, no electricity. They say they are dealing with, quote, barbaric terrorists, and that, quote, we will act accordingly. On the ground in Hamas-controlled Gaza, ambulances rushing to the scene tonight. Israel's retaliatory strikes, leaving more than 600 dead. Cries for help as buildings burn, children carried to safety. This man weeping, his head in his hands as he sits on a pile of rubble. A home hit by an Israeli airstrike, four of the seven family members who live there presumed dead. Hamas releasing this drone footage. They say an Israeli tank in the crosshairs, then the strike and explosion. Tonight, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu comparing Hamas to ISIS, saying the enemy are animals, executing children and parents in front of families. The retaliation comes 48 hours after a sweeping, coordinated and brutal assault that left much of Israel under attack. The worst attack on Israel in 50 years. More than 900 dead here in Israel, at least 11 Americans among them. Some of the first missiles seen just after 6 a.m. in the sky above a music festival near the Gaza border. Young people could be seen running for their lives. This haunting drone video posted online showing the aftermath. The cars abandoned, lining the road. A staggering 260 people were killed here. We learn of a young man at that festival who raced into a shelter, only to witness many of his own friends shot and killed right in front of him. 30-year-old Saho Bensalon. Glad you're okay. Thank you very much. 
shot in the arm and the leg, telling us he ran for his life and hid in that shelter with 30 others. He estimates 20 of them did not get out alive. One of my friends, uh, she got uh, choked by the smoke. So she tried to run away and she got tackled with the, the terrorists who, got, who tried to get inside to shoot at us. And just he dropped her on the floor and started to shoot, kill her, with, shoot her to that shelter. The horror unleashed on that festival was just the beginning. Hamas militants going door to door in small towns and villages. Witnesses say they were killing indiscriminately, leaving bodies in the street, some shot in their cars. And witnesses say in homes where they didn't kill, they took hostages, mothers and children, seniors dragged away, taken back to Gaza. Yoni, I'm David, thank you for having us. I'm thank sorry, you. I'm sorry you're still waiting. Thank you for coming. This young father, Yoni Asher, was on the phone with his wife. She had brought their two young daughters, two and four, to see their grandmother. She called her husband after they rushed into a safe room in the house. They knew the militants were outside. She was whispering. I didn't hear background. I uh, didn't hear the girls. Um, she was frightening. And um, when they called disconnected, I just couldn't do anything. I just went down on the floor like this on my knees and couldn't feel my legs and try to hope for the best. The call drops. He had no idea what happened to his wife and children until this video. Yoni says this is his wife, Duran. He watches as militants start to cover his wife's head. He sees a flash of one of his daughters. I recognized them immediately and uh, I saw the video twice. And the second time, I couldn't watch anymore because um, I got, um, I got, um, I melt down. I, I didn't know uh, what to do. I, um, I couldn't believe this is happening to me. It was, uh, it was a nightmare. It was the worst possible scenario. He has not heard from his wife since. Her cell phone now pings from Gaza. He is terrified for her and for his daughters. The phone is in Khan Yunis, which is inside Gaza. And that point, I, I really feared that um, she'd been taken. That too. she'd been taken. Yeah. Okay. This is your firstborn. This is my. He shows me the photos of his family, the smiles, the girls in their dresses, a father proud to hold his daughter. These are their drawings, their little play kitchen, and their shoes, right where they left them. Tonight, Israel says there are at least 100 hostages being held in Gaza. And Hamas is now warning tonight that they will start executing Israeli hostages if the bombing continues without warning. They say some of the hostages are already dead. What's your message to those who took your wife and daughters? My message to them is um, don't hurt my wife. Don't hurt my little girls. Show some decency. Show some respect. And tonight, as Israeli soldiers now amass at the border with Gaza, a young Israeli commander will not be there. He was one of the first to respond when the Hamas attacks began. 20-year-old military commander Yuval Patiev. Hi, I'm David. I'm Good to meet you. He watched as the militants charged toward him. He says they put a bomb under the tank. One terrorist climbed under the tank. He put an explosive bomb right under my seat. So when he blew it, I flew like in the air. At the moment, I really, I knew that I broke my leg. So I told my commander that he should take my tourniquet and should put it on the... You asked them to put your tourniquet yeah, on yeah. you? Yeah, you... I, I just opened the gate and told him to put it right here. And did you think you could lose your leg? Yeah, I did, but I... I just did what it trained us. His leg shattered and bleeding. Yuval says they were under attack, trapped in that tank for hours. He can still see their faces. You look at them and how could you do this to someone like All they saw was hate and trying to murder you. So we just fought for our lives. Everybody got together, hold everything close, trying to 
pray that they won't get uh, they won't get to open the tank, won't explode it, and God was with us. That's all I can say. Well, glad you're okay. Right. That you survived. Yeah. And you have your leg. Yeah. They say it's gonna be okay. Yeah, it's gonna be okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, A young soldier. That young commander thought he was going to die in that tank. And that young husband, by the way, who's still waiting for word on his wife and two young daughters, just two and four years old, they continue to wait along with so many families. We know of at least about 100 captives being held inside Gaza. And of course, that new threat tonight from Hamas, that if this retaliation from Israel continues, they could start killing those captives one by one on video for the world to see. Just an extraordinary and haunting threat from Hamas tonight. And Lindsay, before we toss it back to you, just a reminder of that key number tonight. Israel has now amassed 300,000 Israeli soldiers on the border with Gaza. Very clear here that another chapter is soon coming. Lindsay. So much about this is haunting. David in Tel Aviv for us. Thank you. As Israel retaliates against Gaza, Hamas is now threatening to execute those 100 hostages on camera one by one. So many families fear their loved ones may never make it home. Our James Longman is also on the ground in Israel. Tonight, with Israel now pounding Gaza and Hamas reacting with a threat to kill its captives, the fate of more than 100 Israeli hostages hanging in the balance. Their loved ones grow more desperate, wondering, will they make it home alive? She, wants her, she just wants her to come home back safe and sound. The family of 19-year-old Karina Ashayev, an Israeli army recruit, recognized her in this video circulating online, bloody and bound as she was taken into Gaza. In another video, Karina is seen surrounded by other kidnapped women. Her sister Sasha tells me Karina was doing her military service at a base on the Gaza border. And she says after a few weeks of training, Karina was told she wouldn't need a weapon. The girls weren't prepared for this. They don't know, they, they have no guns. They don't know how to shoot. Karina made one last call home when she saw the militants coming. She felt she knew that she wasn't going to come home. Yes. She, she, she absolutely knew that she's going to die. Her father overcome. She said goodbye to her family. She speak with me on the phone. And she said goodbye. Yes, she said I that. Love you, every of you. Yeah. It is just hard to fathom a, a phone call like that. Uh, James Longman joins us now from Israel. Uh, James, so far the military has reached out to 30 families to tell them their loved ones have been kidnapped. But are their families still waiting for word? Yeah, uh, Lindsay, a lot of families are waiting for word. They don't know if their loved ones have either died or been kidnapped uh, by Hamas militants. Remember, 260 people were killed at that festival alone, and it's just an overwhelming number for the Israeli authorities to have to go through. And that's why they're asking for uh, relatives to come forward. There's a specifically a set up a facility for families to come forward with DNA of their loved ones to try and see if there is a match. I I've heard on more than one occasion now of fathers making the rounds of hospitals with hair from hairbrushes of their children to see if that is a match uh, for some of the dead. It's just the sheer number of dead and number of missing, which is overwhelming for uh, the authorities here. And that's why it's taking some time for families to get the answers they need. But as you say, 30 families have been informed by the Israeli authorities. The IDF says they have information on every single one of the captured Israelis and the race is on to inform them them to speak to them before they have the tragic ordeal of possibly watching as a militant carries through on this threat to start executing hostages uh, online. We don't know when or if that's ever going to happen, but the IDF and the Israeli authorities are really keen to make sure they speak to the families before they have to see that. Mm. Lindsay. And of course we see that the late night sky lighting up behind you. James, stay safe and thank you so much for your reporting. We are learning about more harrowing and heartbreaking stories from those Israeli border communities. Hamas fighters stormed a kibbutz, a communal settlement in southern Israel, taking hostages and destroying the community. Joining us now live is a mother who lives in one of those communities and says her two sons, who are 16 and 12, were both kidnapped by Hamas. She prefers not to be named for security reasons. First off, just want to say our thoughts and prayers. We certainly are sending those out. Uh, 
with you and your family tonight as you deal with this scenario that, that no parent should have to bear. Take us back to the start. You know, what happened in those first moments as Hamas came into your kibbutz? Uh, at 6.30 uh, Saturday morning, we've heard the red alert going off. Unfortunately, that's a routine we're pretty used to. So my two boys who were home alone um, went to the safe room and they, well, they know what to do uh, and got in the safe room and then called me. I was on another place nearby, uh, a different kibbutz, uh, with my spouse, and they were at, with their father this week, that weekend. I'm divorced. Um, and they usually they sleep at my place, uh, even on his weekends. We're only a few hundred meters away, uh, our houses. So uh, on a normal situation for 12 and 16-year-olds, it's... It sounds like a normal situation in this, you know. Uh, and then red alerts were going off, and I was on the phone to them every few minutes. Uh, somewhere around half past eight, uh, they started saying that they were hearing uh, gunshots outside the house, and I tried to calm them down, telling them it's probably the army or our people uh, shooting. Um, and then texts were coming in from other members of the community saying that uh, terrorists are walking around, uh, trying to break into houses, trying to get in. And then about half past eight, they called me um, whispering that they think they heard the door break and someone breaking into the house. And it took another 10 minutes or so. Uh, and I could hear two or three people speaking in Arabic outside the door, getting in. And my youngest, who's only 12, saying to them, don't take me, I'm too young. And that was it. The line cut off. That was the last time I heard from them. Uh, they were taken from their home, from their beds, by barbarians. I, I can't really find another word for it. Um, that's it. And since then, I've heard nothing. Um, I've later found out by one of the videos Hamas put on that uh, their father, um, who was injured, and his uh, and his wonderful girlfriend were also taken hostage. Mm. And I'm only hoping that they're together now. Mm -hmm. That's it. Did it uh, appear that they had left the safe room at some point? No. No, they were in the safe room the whole time, but the safe room don't lock. No one ever thought that we needed to lock the doors in, you know, against a terror attack of this of this sort. The safe rooms were built against missile attacks mm. um, or earthquakes. They weren't meant to be locked against terrorists going to the houses. They went to the houses, they broke everything they could they stole everything they could. They burnt houses. They burnt houses with families in them. They took babies, they took women, they took children, they took elderly people over 85. They took people who were sick. They took injured people. They're just, you know, it, it, barbarians. I'm sorry, but I can't find another word for it. If you could get a message out to your sons tonight, uh, what would that be? I want the world to know that they're holding innocent civilians. I want the world to know that war has rules. Even war has rules. Even ancient wars had rules. This is against all rules. Against all rules of humanity, against all rules of war, against all rules of peace. You know, we gave them work permits, thinking that this would help their economy and would help get well, regain the, the trust. I used to say to my kids, every time we were shot at missiles, that the children in Gaza has a much worse life than theirs, that the situation is much worse than theirs, and they don't have safe rooms, and that they should be sympathetic to them. Mm. We have morals. They don't. 
Are you getting... I want the world, I want the world to demand to release those innocent civilians. I want these children and women and babies back home, and I want my children back home. I want them to fight each other. I want them to annoy each other. I want them to get on my nerves again. I want them back. I want them to be back sleeping in their beds. I can't take a shower without thinking of them being held in hostages in some dirty pit somewhere. I can't eat, I can't sleep. I don't think human beings treat people like this. I'm sorry. I want the world to demand those hostages to be returned to their homes. War has rules. Are you getting any updates at all from the government, from any officials at all? Uh, I've had uh, been contacted like most families, but they don't have much news to give me. Uh, most of the information they have is the information I gave. Uh, so no, I, I'm not getting any, any new information, anything. But I'm keeping my hopes up. I'm hoping that since they took hundreds, hundreds of people, they won't have the capacity or the nerve to keep them there. And I'm hoping the world won't let it happen. I'm begging from a mother to other mothers in every country in the world to think what she would feel like if it was their child. Even mothers in Gaza want a normal life, I'm sure. Um, as a mother myself, hearing from you, I think that um, there's no one who can hear your story and, and not be heartbroken. And it's so important to hear um, your story. And we are certainly hoping for the best um, outcome. And, and I hope that you'll continue to, to keep us informed. And, um, and we are certainly lifting up your entire community tonight. I, I, I can't thank you enough for sharing your story with us. Thank you for having me. And there are horrific discoveries still being made today. 100 bodies were found in one small town in southern Israel. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, spent the day traveling around the region to the towns and villages where Hamas militants swept through. And yet another code red was declared just as Matt was there today. Tonight, the haunting discovery in a small Israeli town. Video circulating online showing Hamas militants taking Israeli citizens hostage during a deadly standoff in Be'eri, six miles from the Gaza border. It took Israeli forces two days to fight off those Hamas militants. And when they were gone, the harrowing scenes left behind. Tonight, word of more than 100 bodies found in this tiny farming community. This video posted by Hamas showing bodies on the ground. We travel today to the bullet-scarred town of Sderot, just two miles from the Gaza border, another community under a relentless barrage of Hamas rockets. Inside, 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 please. Obviously, there was a code red. Two minutes. Two minutes. We're going to stay here for two more minutes. You heard the rockets coming in. That tells you how close you are. There was almost no warning. Put the shelter, Seven okay? seconds to go in the shelter. That's all you have here. So many residents here choosing to leave. Avital telling me that after dozens of her neighbors were killed, she no longer supports peace with the Palestinians. So many drawing lines in the sand. Our, our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, joins us now from southern Israel. And Matt, it, you've covered this region for a long time. I'm curious what strikes you the most about this conflict this time? What, what feels different? In short, everything. Um, Israel has never mobilized this many troops this quickly. That entire area around Gaza is being evacuated of civilians. I have never seen that. These towns that we went into today, there are still cars 
that are blown out, that had been set on fire. They were removing bodies as we were in there. Um, this is different. Israelis, for the first time, are also unanimously, almost unanimously, in support of eradicating Hamas politically and militarily, despite massive opposition to Benjamin Netanyahu. As a military official told us just moments ago, this is different. October 6th was then. Everything after October 7th is now. This is a game changer. Lindsay. Matt Gutman for us in Tel Aviv. Matt, thank you. Joining us now with more from the Palestinian perspective is Dr. Mustafa Barghouti, who is the co-founder of the Palestinian National Initiative. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, according to various organizations from Human Rights Watch to the UN, the violence in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank has claimed countless Palestinian lives over the last couple of years. Are you concerned that these attacks by Hamas on civilians in Israel are ultimately hurting the Palestinian cause? I do not uh, accept killing any civilian, whether Palestinian or Israeli. And I don't think killing civilians is a solution to any problem. Uh, but the reality is that uh, the, the, the root cause of what we see today is the continuation of Israeli illegal occupation of Palestinian land. The fact that the West Bank is still occupied after 56 years uh, and uh, becoming the longest occupation in modern history, an occupation that has transformed into a system of apartheid. Gaza is also under another form of occupation, besieged from every direction. And now Israel is declaring that Palestinians are animals and, that, and, and imposing a, a complete and total siege on Gaza, depriving people from food, from medications, from water, from electricity. A whole population of 2.2 million people are punished today. And I don't think that the killing of civilians in Israel justifies now killing the Palestinians in Gaza and then blaming Palestinians for the fact that Palestinians are killed. This is unacceptable. And dehumanizing Palestinians is unacceptable. The way out of this is different. It should be a de immediate de-escalation, immediate exchange of prisoners, immediate ceasefire, and then finding a way of ending this occupation. For people who are, are unclear from afar exactly what the unrest is about, is it clearly boiled down to a land dispute or, or is it far more complicated than that? No, it's about violation of international law. As I said, uh, Palestinians are subjected to Israeli illegal military occupation. And uh, this illegal occupation has transformed into a system of apartheid, according to Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and even Israeli human rights organization, B'Tselem. This is a much worse apartheid than what prevailed in South Africa at one point of time. Uh, more than that, Mr. Netanyahu has been doing everything he could since he came to power in, 2000, in 1996 to kill the possibility of peace. Uh, this is a very simple case of people who are occupied, people who have been oppressed for 56 years. Uh, my grandfather, my father, my, myself, and my daughter have never seen a day of freedom. Uh, and uh, what Palestinians need is equality like everybody else. What we need is the, our right to be independent, our right to be free from any oppression and from the system of occupation. Can you see any path forward to peace or diplomacy? The only way out of this is immediate ceasefire, immediate de-escalation, immediate exchange of prisoners, so that all Israelis who are now held in Gaza could come home safe, and all Palestinian prisoners who have been in Israeli jails for such a long time, including one that I know that has been there for 43 years, this should stop. And we can open the road to real peace by accepting Palestinians as equal human beings, by, stop, by stopping dehumanizing Palestinians and accept them as equal partners. I've always said, if Israel doesn't want two-state solution, does not want us to be free and end occupation, then let's live together in one democratic state with equal rights. But you cannot say that all of Palestine is only Jewish and Palestinians have no place to stay in especially that our number today is equal to the Israeli Jewish people. 
Dr. Mustafa Barghouti, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate the conversation. Of course, co-founder of the Palestinian National Initiative. Appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you so much. And still ahead, we'll have the latest from the White House with National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby. And as Republicans criticize the White House over its handling of Iran, I'll speak with Foreign Relations Committee senior member, Senator Marco Rubio. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. I'll never forget those sounds. Pow, pow, pow. I go right back to the moment that it happened. I wasn't fast enough. On November 22nd, 1963, the United States lost its innocence. She's the Mormon Momfluencer, whose upbeat videos gave tough love advice on parenting and gained a huge following. But then, the 911 call. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. And now, she's charged with felony child abuse, and all eyes are on her and her business partner. I'm Jody Hildebrandt. And I'm Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie, a momfluencer's double life, impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Tonight, Israel is ordering the complete siege of Gaza. New images show Israeli forces hammering Hamas targets as Hamas militants fire more rockets into Israel. All of this ignited by that surprise attack by Hamas by land, sea, and air on Saturday. More than 900 dead in Israel, at least 11 Americans among them, nearly 700 now dead in Gaza. We go to ABC's chief White House correspondent, Mary Bruce, at the White House. Mary, in addition to the 11 Americans known to be among the dead, does the U.S. believe that there are Americans among the hostages? Well, Lindsay, the White House says there are an unaccounted number of Americans still missing and that we should be bracing for the grim reality that American citizens are likely being held hostage by Hamas. The president spent his day here at the White House behind closed doors meeting with his national security team on the phone with America's allies. And the president tonight is stressing that American safety is his top priority and that he has directed his team to work closely with the Israelis on all aspects of this hostage crisis and the recovery effort. Lindsay. Mary Bruce from the White House, our thanks to you. The U.S. is rushing military supplies and air defenses to Israel, including a Navy carrier strike group. All of this in the hopes of partly sending a warning to others in the region not to make this a wider war. Here's ABC's chief global affairs anchor, Martha Raddatz. Tonight, as Israel unleashes that relentless barrage of missiles on Gaza, the U.S. surging new supplies, weapons, and air defenses to Israel. The massive aircraft carrier USS Gerald Ford, with fighter jets ready to launch on command, there as a deterrent to Iran and its proxies, the Lebanon-based militant group Hezbollah. A U.S. defense official stating that the U.S. is deeply concerned that Hezbollah could make the wrong decision and start a second front in this conflict, which the official described as unprecedented, with ISIS-level tactics and techniques, savagery, the official called it. Israel already desperate for more munitions after being caught totally by surprise by this attack, without question, a colossal intelligence failure. The U.S. seemingly just as surprised. 
U.S. Secretary of State Tony Blinken saying the intelligence failure will be closely examined, but for now, all efforts are on dealing with the present danger from Hamas and potentially others. Lindsay? Martha, thank you. Earlier today, I spoke with White House National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby. President Biden pledged his full support to Prime Minister Netanyahu over the weekend. So first, just give us the latest on what assistance the U.S. is providing for Israel and, and what Israel is saying that it needs at this moment. In these early hours, it's largely in terms of uh, weapons replenishment. You, you can imagine they're, they're, they're going through uh, quite an expenditure of missile interceptors and artillery ammunition, that kind of thing. So I think you can expect that that's really the, 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 the early sets of uh, security assistance that we'll be providing to Israel. And already uh, a, a package of that assistance uh, has been sent to Israel. Is there anything you can tell us on how Israel is navigating how to respond mili militarily in Gaza, knowing so many Israelis are being held hostage there, with Hamas even threatening on-camera executions? Uh, I want to be careful that I'm not speaking for the Israeli government or what their military operations are or will be. I certainly won't get ahead of them uh, in, in a public setting, uh, but you can certainly see by the response over the last 12, 18 hours that it is, it's it's been swift and it's been aggressive. Uh, I mean, the size and scale, the scope of the violence that have been visited upon the Israeli people by Hamas is, on, is unprecedented. Can you confirm whether any American citizens are, in fact, among those being held hostage? I cannot confirm that, but we do have a number of Americans who their whereabouts are, are unknown. They're unaccounted for. Um, and we don't really know whether they're just missing somewhere or are lost or whether they're being held hostage. I think we have to accept the possibility uh, that at least some of them uh, are being held hostage by uh, Hamas. And obviously, we, we take that very seriously. We're in constant communication with Israeli officials to try to get as much granularity and information as we can about these Americans. Uh, but sadly, we, we just don't have good, solid answers right now. As you know, the Wall Street Journal has reported that Iranian security officials helped plan the Hamas attack and, quote, gave the green light for the assault at a meeting in Beirut last week. Has the U.S. confirmed the level of Iran's involvement in planning and the execution of this attack? We have not, and neither have our Israeli counterparts. We don't have specific intelligence or evidence that says Iran was directly participating uh, and involved in these particular attacks. Now, that said, uh, make no mistake, there's, an, there's a degree of complicity here just by virtue of the fact that Iran has been supporting Hamas militarily from a resource perspective uh, with training for now a couple of decades. So this is not a new relationship. Uh, they have helped lead to the kinds of ability that Hamas uh, uh, has in the field. So there's a there's an air of complicity there. As you well know, Republicans have criticized the recent deal to unfreeze six billion dollars in Iranian assets as aiding this Hamas attack. Even if none of that money has been touched, what do you say to the critics who say just having access to those funds for humanitarian purposes allowed Tehran to free up other money to aid groups like Hamas? I would say a couple of things. First of all, uh, this is exactly the same arrangement that the previous administration uh, executed, uh, almost in exactly the same way in terms of allowing the purchase of Iranian oil and that revenue cannot be used uh, by Iran for anything other than humanitarian purposes. I would also add that not a single dinar of that $6 billion that has been transferred to Qatar uh, and unfrozen has actually been allocated into Iran. They haven't seen a single a bit of it uh, going forward. So, look, we can always refreeze that funds, uh, those funds if we feel like we need to. We're not at that uh, point. I don't have a policy decision to make on that. A spokesman for Iran's foreign ministry released a statement today saying the West should realize their responsibilities in the continuation of aggression against the Palestinian nation. What's your response to that, which I think is fair to say is a widely held view in the Middle East? Uh, it's also uh, a widely distributed set of propaganda talking points uh, by Iran. Uh, the president continues to believe in the viability of a two-state solution, which offers peace and justice for both Israelis and for Palestinians. Obviously, the focus today rightly needs to be uh, on the violence inside Israel and these, uh, these reprehensible terrorist attacks. I would also say uh, that Hamas doesn't speak for all Palestinians and for their aspirations, for their desires to, again, have uh, a state of their own and to be able to live in peace and security. That is something the United States believes in and will continue to pursue. John Kirby at the White House, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. 
Joining us now is a senior member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Republican Marco Rubio. Senator, thank you so much for your time tonight. Uh, you've seen the harrowing images. We've heard the heartbreaking stories from parents whose children are being held hostage. What should the U.S. government be doing right now to help Israel? Well, first, like everybody else, our thoughts, our prayers, our, and our heartache uh, is with these families that are having to see these images online in real time. Uh, I cannot, I just can't imagine what that must feel like or what that's like. I think that the, US, the most important role the U.S. has to have right now is, is support, d direct and, and moral and diplomatic and international support on behalf of Israel to make abundantly clear to their enemies that we're going to stand at Israel and we're going to provide them whatever they need to win. And the good news is that, unlike some of the challenges we've seen with Ukraine and so forth, f the U.S.-Israeli defense uh, arrangement uh, is codified. We actually passed a bill, my bill, back in uh, December of 2020 that actually puts in place, uh, that gives the uh, administration authority from now till 2028 to spend a minimum or, or to be involved in a minimum of over $3.3 billion a year in assistance. So they already have the authority to do a lot. The Israelis are also very capable. They're not asking and never have asked and never will ask us to send American soldiers. What they basically will need is resupply. Um, some of that's already been pre-positioned before all of this, so that's good. But the most, the second most important thing is trying to prevent this from escalating into a broader conflict. And that's where the messaging that's going on right now through Qatar, through Egypt, through all these other nations to Iran is so important. And the message needs to be, if the U.S. is attacked or this thing is escalated with, with, that implicates uh, whether it's U.S. servicemen in the region, servicewomen in the region, or facilities in the region, whether it's Iran directly or through their proxies, we're going to hold Iran responsible. We're going to consider it an attack by the Iranian state, and we will respond in kind. And that is really critical here, because what you don't want to see is this devolve into a second front uh, from Lebanon uh, or, or, from, uh, or from the West Bank, uh, but primarily from Lebanon, because that, that injects the level of danger here that, that, that goes even higher. You've called for Hamas to be eradicated and for Israel to Absolutely. respond to this attack disproportionately. How do you do that with Hamas now threatening to execute hostages if Israeli airstrikes continue without warning? Yeah, look, there's no good options here, but there's only one that actually achieves the purpose that Israel needs. You cannot coexist. You cannot live near this level of depravity, this level of, 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 of such a sinister, this level of evil. Now, these are people that deliberately targeted these terrorists deliberately targeted teenage girls, children, women, the elderly. They deliberately targeted them. And then they did not just for murder and rape and all these other horrific acts, but then, you know, bringing their bodies back and dumping them in the streets of Gaza so that the crowds can then defile their lifeless bodies. This is a level of depravity you simply can't coexist with. If these guys are not eliminated, these people are not eliminated, they will do this again at an even higher level. And unfortunately, in that neighborhood, it sends a message to others. If they got away with this, there are things we're gonna, it'll, we can get away with. It will encourage future attacks with much more horrifying impact. I mean, Hezbollah's military capabilities are substantially greater than what Hamas has. And uh, what you would be encouraging there. I don't think this is, this is horrifying. I mean, what's going to have to happen here truly is horrifying. We have to prepare ourselves for that. But there literally is no other option at this point, especially since Hamas uses civilians, children, others, as human shields. What do you say to those who are critical of the role the U.S. has played in recent years, who say the U.S. exacerbated tensions in the region through actions advocated by people like you who supported, for example, moving the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem and not involving a Palestinian voice in the Abraham Accords negotiated by former President Trump? Your response to those critics? Well, that's not why this is happening. They didn't murder women. First of all, there's no excuse for murdering civilians going in and deliberately targeting teenage girls out in the desert to, to, to rape them and murder them. So there's no excuse for that. But number two, I would say that that's not why any of this is happening. Hamas is not attacking because they want an embassy. Hamas is not attacking because they want to be part of the Abraham Accord. Hamas is attacking because their organizing principle, the reason why they exist, their stated purpose for existing, is they want to destroy the Jewish state. They do not want Israel to exist as a Jewish state. They want that to be a Muslim country populated by people like them. That, that's their stated goal. That's Iran's stated goal. And these attacks are designed not to militarily defeat Israel, but to destroy its economy, destroy, uh, drive people out, out of there, destroy its relationships internationally, and cause Israel to collapse from within. That is their stated goal. That is the reason why they're attacking. This is not over land. This is uh, not because they want Gaza to have economic opportunity. It's because they want to destroy the Jewish state. That's not me saying it. That's their stated mission. That's why they exist. That's, uh, th that's always been why they've existed. And that's why these attacks are happening. 
Senator Marco Rubio, so appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming on the Thank show. Thank you. Thank you. And coming up, as Israel prepares to strike back against Gaza, we'll look at why this attack was not detected in advance. But next, the history of efforts at peace in the Middle East by the numbers. He's here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Welcome back, everyone. As we cover the outbreak of war in the Middle East tonight, we want to take a step back to give a bit of perspective and a bit of background on the long-running conflict and the attempts to try to find a peaceful resolution by the numbers. 1948, that's when the state of Israel was first formed and the modern conflict began. Displaced Palestinians began fighting the new state immediately, and over the following years, tensions rose across the region. In 1979, President Jimmy Carter brought representatives from Egypt and Israel together to sign the Camp David Accord. But while that improved relations between Israel and its neighbors, the questions of Palestinian self-determination and self-governance remained unresolved. In 1991, in the wake of the first Gulf War, President George Bush co-hosted the Madrid summit. It was the first time all the parties to the Arab-Israeli conflict gathered for direct negotiations, but they failed to reach an agreement. In 1993, the Oslo Accords set up a framework for the Palestinians to govern themselves in the West Bank and Gaza. And in 1995, the Accords were expanded expanded to mandate Israel's withdrawal from settlements in the West Bank. Multiple peace talks followed, but ultimately broke down. And in 2000, President Bill Clinton brought Israeli and Palestinian leaders together at Camp David, but they failed to reach a deal, and the second Palestinian Intifada soon followed. Then in 2007, President George W. Bush hosted a conference at the U.S. Naval Academy, establishing the two-state solution as the basis for future talks between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, but failed to reach a lasting agreement. Agreement. Most recently in 2020, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain agreed to normalize relations with Israel. The so-called Abraham Accords followed U.S.-hosted talks between Israel and several Arab states focused on the peace process. Palestinian leaders later rejected the accords. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight. The painstaking process of recovering the dead in Israel is now underway. We speak to an organization on the ground doing that difficult work. And we dive into what this attack could mean for Israel's government and Iran's potential role in directing this attack. It was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, OK, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every back. We are continuing our in-depth coverage of the outbreak of war in the Middle East. And as we digest just the magnitude of what has happened in the past few days and what this coordinated multi-pronged attack that killed 250 Israelis at a music festival means for Israel, for Gaza, and for the whole Middle East. We're talking with people from both sides of the story. Today, I spoke with a veteran of the bloodshed from the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. He works with a group charged with recovering the dead from terror attacks, identifying them, and returning them to their families for burial. He's been working at the music festival site, and he said nothing he's ever seen in all of his years working in the region prepared him for this. Uh, we've seen a lot of gruesome things over the years, but nothing compares uh, to what we have seen over the past a couple of days. Um, the scale of what we're seeing is beyond imagination. It's like walking into a horror film, uh, just seeing the, uh, the sheer uh, magnitude of bodies of men, women, children massacred in their cars, in their houses. Uh, it's indescribable. For more context with regard to the factors that got us to this point, I want to bring in contributing writer and columnist for The New Yorker, Robin Wright. Robin, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Israel, as you know, has one of the world's most sophisticated, well-funded intelligence networks. The question on so many minds, how did this happen? How did they not see this coming? Well, the focus at the time, both in Israel and in Washington, was really on what was happening in the West Bank. There were 
growing tensions and a sense that protests could erupt at any time. And so uh, Hamas pulled a fast one on everyone. And it's it, there'll be a lot of probes going to, down the road looking at what happened, why people weren't focused. This is an issue, this was a danger that should not have been ignored and should have been gamed and understood for a very long time. Hey, what do you think the fallout's going to be for Prime Minister Netanyahu as well as his far-right far government? Well, short term, there's a unity in response to Hamas in Israel. I think down the road, there will be a lot of questions about why either his government or his intelligence service or his focus wasn't on the dangers from Hamas. Israel's reaction to Hamas's attack has been deadly, of course. More than 600 people killed in the Gaza Strip so far, more than 3,700 wounded. What's the end game here for Israel? Well, this war is unlike any previous war between Hamas and Israel. The scope of this conflict is so utterly astonishing in the tactics, in the uniformity, in the uh, the coordination that the end game, I think, is a good way down the road. But I think it's going to be it's going to look very different than it has in the past. Israel is committed to trying to obliterate Hamas, destroy its arsenal, eliminate its leadership. But the reality is very hard. Down the road, it's hard to kill an idea. It's hard to kill uh, the kind of passions and fury that are unleashed on either side. And let's also talk about just the further complexity here is that you have the hostages. So when they're bombarding uh, these buildings where they feel like Hamas is, is hiding potentially, you, what's the risk now to, to those hostages? The, the risk to hostages is very high. Uh, the problem is that the taking of hostages and the human drama and trauma it unleashes often, often it lasts or ends up taking far longer to resolve than a war itself. So I fear that even after the end of hostilities that Hamas will have the leverage of these human lives and may exact a, a higher or longer term cost from uh, Hamas. There's, of course, been reporting from the Wall Street Journal suggesting that Iran helped plot the Hamas attacks and gave the final go ahead. Do you believe that to be true? And if so, why would Iran get involved? Iran is complicit in everything that Hamas has done. It has been since the late 1980s, the primary funder, uh, arms supplier and political supporter of the Palestinian extremist group, both Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. But the, the question remains, as both the Israelis and the United States have said in the last few days, what exact role did it have in directing, ordering this assault? The reality is that the Palestinians have their own agenda, and while they rely heavily on Iran, uh, and coordinate very closely with Iran, are trained by Iran. Uh, what We don't have answers yet about exactly what role it had. Um, but again, Iran is complicit and has been for decades. Contributing writer and columnist for The New Yorker, Robin Wright, so appreciate your time and insight. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, the devastation in Afghanistan from a 6.3 magnitude earthquake. We have the very latest. And we return to Maui. As some on the island say it's not time to welcome tourists back as the displaced still struggle for a place to call home. news breaks. It's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. You
your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. Me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. She's the Mormon Momfluencer, whose upbeat videos gave tough love advice on parenting and gained a huge following. But then, the 911 call. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. Ruby Frankie is his mom's name. And now, she's charged with felony child abuse, and all eyes are on her and her business partner. I'm Jody Hildebrandt. And I'm Ruby Frankie. Ruby Frankie, a momfluencer's double life, impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with the horror of war and the harrowing stories after Hamas fighters stormed into Israel, killing indiscriminately, kidnapping children, women, and the elderly. It's being called Israel's Pearl Harbor, or it's 9-11. It is the worst attack on that country's soil in 50 years. Tonight, Hamas has at least 100 people hostage, and they are vowing to kill them one by one. The death toll on both sides is already staggering. At least 900 Israelis, including 100 bodies found today in a small farming town. Thousands more are injured. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the country is preparing for a long war. Israel has called up 300,000 military reserves and has cut off all food, water, and electricity to the Gaza Strip and started airstrikes. Nearly 700 people have died there. At least 91 of them are children. But what happens to those hostages if Israel continues to bombard Gaza? And there is concern tonight Americans may be among those being held. World News Tonight anchor David Muir leads us off tonight from Tel Aviv. Tonight, Israel at war. Hundreds of Israeli rockets pounding Gaza for hours. Retaliation for the brutal Hamas attack on Israel. Thick black plumes of smoke billowing into the sky. These men capturing the destruction unfold from inside a neighboring building as the sun sets, explosions lighting up the night sky. targets in just three hours. Dozens of Israeli fighter jets. Tonight, the Israeli Defense Ministry declaring a total siege of the Gaza Strip. No power, no water, no electricity. They say they are dealing with, quote, barbaric terrorists, and that, quote, we will act accordingly. On the ground in Hamas-controlled Gaza, ambulances rushing to the scene tonight. Israel's retaliatory strikes, leaving more than 600 dead. Cries for help as buildings burn. Children carried to safety. 
This man weeping, his head in his hands, as he sits on a pile of rubble. A home hit by an Israeli airstrike. Four of the seven family members who live there presumed dead. Hamas releasing this drone footage. They say an Israeli tank in the crosshairs. Then the strike and explosion. Tonight, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu comparing Hamas to ISIS, saying the enemy are animals, executing children and parents in front of families. The retaliation comes 48 hours after a sweeping, coordinated and brutal assault that left much of Israel under attack. The worst attack on Israel in 50 years. More than 900 dead here in Israel, at least 11 Americans among them. Some of the first missiles seen just after 6 a.m. in the sky above a music festival near the Gaza border. Young people could be seen running for their lives. This haunting drone video posted online showing the aftermath. The cars abandoned, lining the road. A staggering 260 people were killed here. We learn of a young man at that festival who raced into a shelter, only to witness many of his own friends shot and killed right in front of him. 30-year-old Saho Ben Salon. Glad you're okay. Thank you very much. Shot in the arm and the leg, telling us he ran for his life and hid in that shelter with 30 others. He estimates 20 of them did not get out alive. One of my friends, uh, she got uh, choked by the smoke. She tried to run away and she got tackled with the, the terrorists who, got, who tried to get inside to shoot at us. And just he dropped her on the floor and started to shoot, kill her with shoot at that shelter. The horror unleashed on that festival was just the beginning. Hamas militants going door to door in small towns and villages. Witnesses say they were killing indiscriminately, leaving bodies in the street. Some shot in their cars. And witnesses say in homes where they didn't kill, they took hostages. Mothers and children, seniors, dragged away, taken back to Gaza. Yoni, I'm David. Thank you for having us. I'm Thank sorry. You. I'm sorry you're still waiting. Thank you for coming. This young father, Yoni Asher, was on the phone with his wife. She had brought their two young daughters, two and four, to see their grandmother. She called her husband after they rushed into a safe room in the house. They knew the militants were outside. She was whispering. I didn't hear background. I uh, didn't hear the girls. Um, she was frightening. And um, when they called disconnected, I just couldn't do anything. I just went down on the floor like this on my knees. Um, couldn't feel my legs and try to hope for the best. The call drops. He had no idea what happened to his wife and children until this video. Yoni says this is his wife, Duran. He watches as militants start to cover his wife's head. He sees a flash of one of his daughters. I recognized them immediately and uh, I saw the video twice. And the second time I couldn't watch anymore because um, I got... Um, I got, um, I melt down. I, I didn't know uh, what to do. I, um, I couldn't believe this is happening to me. It was, uh, it was a nightmare. It was the worst possible scenario. He has not heard from his wife since. Her cell phone now pings from Gaza. He is terrified for her and for his daughters. The phone is in Khan Yunis, which is inside Gaza. And that point, I, I really feared that... Um, She'd been taken, that too. She'd been taken, yeah. Okay. This is your firstborn? This is my... He shows me the photos of his family, the smiles, the girls in their dresses, a father proud to hold his daughter. These are their drawings, their little play kitchen, and their shoes right where they left them. Tonight, Israel says there are at least 100 hostages being held in Gaza. And Hamas is now warning tonight that they will start executing Israeli hostages if the bombing continues without warning. They say some of the hostages are already dead. What's your message to those who took your wife and daughters? My message to them is um, don't hurt my wife. Don't hurt my little girls. 
show some decency, show some respect. And tonight, as Israeli soldiers now amass at the border with Gaza, a young Israeli commander will not be there. He was one of the first to respond when the Hamas attacks began. 20-year-old military commander Yuval Patiev. Hi, I'm David. Hi. Good to meet you. He watched as the militants charged toward him. He says they put a bomb under the tank. One terrorist climbed under the tank. He put an explosive bomb right under my seat. So when he blew it, I flew like in the air. At the moment, I really, I knew that I broke my leg. So I told my commander that he should take my tourniquet and should put it on the... You asked them to put your tourniquet yeah, on yeah. you. Yeah, you... I just opened the gate and told him to put it right here. And did you think you could lose your leg? Yeah, I did, but I, I just did what it trained us. His leg shattered and bleeding. Yuval says they were under attack, trapped in that tank, for hours, he can still see their faces. You look at them and how could you do this to someone like that? All they saw was hate and trying to murder you. So we just fought for our lives. Everybody got together, hold everything close, trying to pray that they won't get uh, they won't get to open the tank, won't explode it. And God was with us. That's all I can say. I, well, glad you're okay. Right. That you survived. Yeah. And you have your leg. Yeah. They say it's going to be okay? Yeah, it's going to be okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. His life and leg spared. We certainly welcome those outcomes in this dark time. Our thanks to David for that. In Gaza, growing grief and devastation. Israel has controlled the territory's borders for years. So how was Hamas able to organize and launch such a sophisticated attack without Israel becoming aware of it? ABC's chief foreign correspondent Ian Panel reports from the border. Tonight, Israel on a war footing. A hundred thousand reservists amassing in the south, moving towards Gaza. This conflict looks set to enter a new phase. A ground invasion could be imminent. We're starting to see large-scale movements of the Israeli military throughout this area in the south now. These are armoured personnel carriers essentially heading up towards the front line. We're seeing a lot of men, a lot of munitions, and a lot of movement. This is starting to look really like a country at war. And now Gaza, one of the world's most densely populated areas, is under relentless bombardment. But many civilians are being caught in the crossfire. Over 680 people killed in three days, 140 of them children, according to Gaza's health ministry. For parents on both sides of the border, the grief overwhelming. And whole neighborhoods are being wiped out. A frantic scene as rescue workers dig for miracles. Is there anyone alive? This man shouts. And from this pile of debris, six month old Sama Al Wadia pulled out, still alive. The problem has started before this crisis. We have had shortage of medications, medical supplies prior to this crisis. <laughs> And already struggling hospitals are now overwhelmed, with Israel now cutting off water, electricity and food to Gaza, one doctor with this warning. The health system will collapse. What will you do without water, electricity, medication? Of course, there will be a collapse. The problem is that every, every five minutes you have a new breaking news talking about more and more injured Palestinians, among civilians, of course. There will be no room for those people to be treated in hospitals. That's why I think the best thing to do if this war should stop at once and at the same time they should open the borders for us to send patients outside, maybe to Egypt, maybe to Jordan, maybe to the West Bank, I don't know, but they should, the border should be open. And even today, Hamas still hitting Israeli cities and civilian areas. We witnessed it firsthand. Just hearing a sound of, we just had the air raid siren. There you go, you can hear the sound of an explosion. Overhead, I can see some smoke up there. Sounds like the noise of an intercept, uh, perhaps from the Israeli Iron Dome defense system. And that's what people here have to live with all the time at the now. 
It turns out Hamas have been planning its shock attack on Israel in secret for months. Now releasing this video showing fighters training on motorized paragliders practicing their descent into Israel. How this all began 48 hours ago. But the hell Hamas unleashed for so many may only just have begun. Now spilling back into Gaza. Our thanks to Ian Panel, and we'll have some of the other news making headlines tonight, including the devastating t death toll from a massive earthquake in Afghanistan. We'll be right back. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. We continue to monitor developments out of Israel and Gaza as tensions only grow amid the horror of war. But for now, we'll bring you some other developing stories around the world. In Afghanistan, a 6.3 magnitude earthquake has left one of the largest cities absolutely devastated. The Taliban administration said at least 2,000 people were killed and thousands more injured, with death tolls continuing to rise. Crucial infrastructure such as bridges to the destroyed region have been damaged, delaying emergency response teams. For those seeking help, Help the region has only one government-run hospital. The global response to the earthquake has been slow due to the challenges of dealing with the Taliban-led government, as well as the deadly escalation between Israel and Palestinians. And California Governor Gavin Newsom has vetoed a bill that would have made California the first U.S. state to ban caste-based discrimination. Advocates of the bill argued if passed, it would protect people of South Asian descent who were treated unfairly. Newsom said that the state already banned discrimination based on religion, writing in a letter to California lawmakers. This bill is unnecessary. The bill was met with both praise and backlash from community members. And still ahead, two months after the devastating wildfires on Maui, why some residents are saying it's too soon for tourists to return. We'll be right back. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. For the thousands of displaced people on Maui, the word home has taken on new meaning. Maybe it isn't four walls as it once was. Instead, it might be family, neighbors, and their community. But as the displaced try to find a permanent place to stay, a controversial move on the island. Tourists are now being welcomed back in areas that were badly damaged by the wildfires. Tonight in our Maui 808 initiative, ABC's Mola Lange shows us why some on the island say it's too much too soon. that sense of slight sense of despair the drive home from Miguel Ceballos is far different than it used to be it's hard because a reality sets in that it's not the same anymore hey brother sir can you reverse as he turns onto his block there's now a checkpoint like we got clearance to be able to go in so we're gonna go ahead and take a look This is our street, Kanyao. It's generational homes. Driving home from work, you'd see families outside talking, eating dinner. That's one thing this community was all about. So this is my home here to the right. This is all that's left. On September 25th, Maui County officially reopened his neighborhood to its residents. His 13-year-old daughter, Linnell, came along to feed the wild chickens they raised in their backyard. 
One, when she was a little baby chick, she was only black and white, so we named her Oreo. Yeah, that's all right. They walk a small path beside the rubble and find what were once their bicycles. Watch out for this stuff. It's on the ground. I think they recognize you. This is actually Oreo right here. To her surprise, Oreo has a new family. They look like they're only like maybe a week old. Like less than a week old, I can tell. Too young to know what was once here, the remains of their family home, a constant reminder of what happened here. We had our rooms on this side, and then it'd go up into where we'd have our living room and kitchen. Many of the homes in Lahaina were passed down over generations. Now, as they begin to comprehend their losses and pick up the pieces to their broken lives, the rest of West Maui prepares to reopen to tourists. It's just not right to go back in into full force tourism. We're still recovering. Funerals just started and they want us to go back in. Everybody knew. Everybody knew most. Everybody on that list of names that came out. This is what it looks like when your people are put last. Miguel, his wife Lindsay, and their four children are currently calling this condo home. They've moved three times in the two months since the fire. I'm just making sure we keep everything in our suitcases. You know, don't be unpacking stuff because you don't know where we're going next. I love this shirt. All four kids share this one room. Miguelito, for some reason, prefers to sleep on the ground with some blankets and pillows. But me and Luisa sleep together, and then Layla sleeps. Oh, in her own bed. Anybody got bingo yet? Catholic Charities is housing them through Airbnb vouchers, but with theirs expiring on October 10th, their next home is uncertain. The family now turning to the Red Cross for help. We're already hearing even today the hotels are full, you know, or the, the spots they have is full. Um, Our people are getting kicked out because yeah. the tourists are coming back. The Red Cross has housed more than 7,600 survivors across 40 hotels since the fire. Among them, Nicole Ellison, her two children, her mother, Monica, and their two dogs. This is your bedroom, your living room, your kitchen, your family room, everything is right in here. All of them sharing a single bed. And it's a king-size bed. Mm -hmm. When they had originally put you up in the hotel, what what did they tell you? If there, if there was a, a time frame or, or you know, that. Did they give you a date when you had to leave by? We found out on Saturday by a voicemail message that we had to be out this coming Friday, the 29th. And that was the first we heard that we had to be out on that date. That voicemail missing a key detail, where they'll go next, wherever it is, will be their sixth move since the fire. And while many of the wildfire victims in this community rely on tourism for work, they say they're just not ready. Resentful that the reopening is happening at the expense of their hale, or home. Weeks before the reopening, hundreds crammed into this city council meeting, uncertain of their future. Should we open? I don't think so. Residents like Charles Nahale. Oh, my house burned. Uh, it's completely gone. Charles is a wedding singer and efficient. It's my honor to pronounce you husband and wife. Once dependent on tourists, he now relies on temporary disaster assistance. He says he's far from ready for West Maui to reopen. Are we supposed to be jovial when tourists are here in their bathing suits, frolicking in the surf? driving these roads like they're on a racetrack, drinking Mai Tais and partying in our face. After losing his family home, Charles was placed in a timeshare by the Red Cross, but he may once again be on the move. This is the letter that all of us at this shelter where I'm staying at got telling us that we would have to vacate the premises on the 30th. And again, this came by September. total surprise. By right? total surprise, on your door. I have to leave where I'm at. 
in, in a few, couple of days. With no idea of where you're going? No idea, yeah. Nevertheless, state officials have stuck to their schedule. We had to choose a date. There were too many businesses that, and I'm talking big businesses, hotels would have gone bankrupt if they couldn't open. Charles has filed a civil complaint with the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission, alleging the eviction notice violates state and federal fair housing laws. These facilities took FEMA money and they took Red Cross money. We're really not transients anymore. So we've become tenants right. when they took that money. Has a little partial ocean view. But on September 29th, Charles finding out that his eviction has been delayed. A small victory. All of a sudden, now that we've filed a complaint, oh, don't worry about leaving tomorrow. Displaced fire victims also facing eviction at Honoakai condos. One condo owner filing a complaint after receiving a letter from the condo board president telling owners they would have to terminate their contract with the Red Cross. Here we are. Sarah Verastro and her son Miles have been living at the Honoakai for the past month. The anticipation is all consuming. We we can't as much as oh we got a notice. We got a notice under the door. Shall we see what it is? It's from Can you read it for us, Miles? Oh, they're gonna tidy up the place. When the note came under, it's kind of like, is this it? Is 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 this the is this gonna be you have three days to vacate the premise? Sarah moved into their Lahaina home just a week before the fire destroyed it. Here we are, home sweet home. Her video diaries showing what's left. <sighs> the emotions overwhelming. <laughs> a few items Sarah found. This is my son's favorite thing to go to sleep to. Look at that. <laughs> a piece of home when they need it most. It's my starling that survived the fire. We are constantly on the lookout for something that we can afford. Our rental market is so expensive. You good? For Nicole Ellison's family, it's been one home to the next. Less than 24 hours we were given to move properties and have all of our stuff out by 12 o'clock. <laughs> Nicole says the Red Cross gave her two choices move into a tent community, which the state has deemed unsafe for children, or move into a hotel that will not allow her dogs. Before the fires, Nicole and her family were living in Kahale Akiola homeless shelter, destroyed in the fire. Just because our housing situation wasn't like most everyone else, doesn't mean that we're not feeling the same things and need the same things. Finally, they've been told there's space for them at a West End hotel just outside of Lahaina. If we get to the West End and something happens, we will be living in my car. Here in my unicorn. After hours of packing... And just got checked in at 6 o'clock. The family checks into their new hotel. They didn't give us a time of when we're going to be checking out. They just gave us our key and we'll be in touch. But a glimmer of joy. And two beds. Oh my God. With room on the floor. Yeah. 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 For many of these displaced Hawaiians, these temporary shelters are as close to something stable as they've had in months. It's been like home. For now, home. Or, as they say around here, Hale. Your Hale will go wherever you go and be wherever you are. Ali, our thanks to Mola for that. ABC News reached out to the Red Cross. The Red Cross says it's trying to meet each family's particular needs while housing thousands of displaced residents in hotels throughout Maui. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. Have a great night.